this is the Sustainability Sentinel. So, so. Ah, I'm so glad you're here. All right, Thank we are you. joined today by Leah Penniman, an esteemed food justice advocate and co-director of Soul Fire Farm outside Albany, New York. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Your farm is dedicated to ending racism and injustice in the food system. I think for many of us, having access to food is something we take for granted. Mm. Can you tell me anything or tell me something about food injustice and what that means? Well, for me, it's really personal. You know, I don't take for granted having food. I grew up in a rural, impoverished area, living in a trailer, and with often bare pantry and, and bare fridge, and would save my lunch money, you know, so that I would have spending money on the weekends, which meant often skipping meals. And so there's a sensitivity built in um, to that life experience around hunger. And, you know, because of my education, I have a master's degree and, and you know, professional credentials. I'm, I'm not in poverty now, but what I experienced when I moved my family from Massachusetts to the Albany, New York area was what we term food apartheid. And food apartheid is that system of segregation that relegates some people to food opulence and others to food scarcity. Mm -hmm. And it's geographic. So even knowing how to farm, uh, you know, having a job, we struggled to feed our children fresh, healthy food. We had a newborn and a two-year-old, and the challenge was that there was no community garden, no grocery stores, no uh, farmer's markets or anything, yeah. and we didn't have a car. And so what that meant is was joining a farm share CSA that was over two miles away for the pickup point and putting the children in a stroller and a backpack, going up the hill, and then as we came back down the hill, you know, piling all of these vegetables onto the laps of these children, yeah. um, which is a lot. It's a lot. And so food justice is about not just having access to food, but also having self-determination in the food system for all peoples having culturally appropriate, affordable, safe food, and then participating in the production, distribution, and consumption of that food as an agent and not as a passive recipient. Um, and it's really become you know, my life's work to try to make sure that all people can have that access. It's amazing. What motivated you other than obviously your upbringing? Um, did you have um, relationships that you saw others struggling or how did, what motivated you to take this amount of responsibility that you've taken? I think love, probably. <laughs> you know, growing up as one of the few brown children in my town, uh, social relationships were really tough. There was a lot of overt, blatant racism and violence mm -hmm. against um, my siblings and I. And the forest and the land were a solace. They were friends. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's not just about you know, what we're working against in terms of hunger and food apartheid, but also what we're really working to cherish and save. And for me, that's the sacred relationship with, with the earth and restoring that dignity in the relationship. You know, my ancestors on my maternal side are black Americans and, and Haitians, and the story of a relationship to land is very clouded by oppression. Mm. And there's ways that that's caused a confusion I think, and a loss in us as to whether we really belong to land or whether it's a source of harm. You know, it was the scene of the crime. And I believe that a piece of our souls is missing if we can't restore that relationship of dignity. So that love, you know, that love and, and uh, passion for relationship with the earth, I think is also a big motivator for starting Soul Fire Farm. That's fantastic. What gets you up in the morning? The sun, <laughs> <laughs> or before the sun, <laughs> the roosters. <laughs> yeah, you know we work super hard. There's definitely times when I ask myself, and I say this to my husband probably, you know, several times a year. Like I'm just getting a job at the post office. I just like can't even. Um, but I think what keeps me going, what keeps us going, is just seeing how necessary the work is. You know. In some ways, it's devastating that people come from 30 states around the nation to our farm mm -hmm. to learn how to farm in our Black Latinx Farmers Immersion Program wow. because that says how much that isn't that type of program isn't existing. You know, mm -hmm. it's certainly an honor for us, but it also is a reminder that if we were to cease to exist, to cease to do this work, that there really would be a vacuum 
in the black land sovereignty, the brown land sovereignty movements. And so I think that's probably when I'm super tired, what keeps me going forward. That's a big one, that's great. Um, so the term, you've used it, food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me what that means. Sure, so shout out to Via Campesina, which is an international peasant movement that exists on all continents except Antarctica, uh, you know, led by people who, smallholders who tend the earth and who do primarily subsistence agriculture. They produce 70% of the world's food. This, this peasant movement, Via Campesina, came up with food sovereignty as a way of describing the type of food system that we really desire. And it's one where everybody gets to participate as producers, distributors, and consumers with agency. So it's not just about getting to eat kale, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually about having a vote and a decision-making voice in terms of what society prioritizes in agriculture. Um, and, it, and it incorporates workers' rights and women's rights too, mm -hmm. because we can't, you know, we can't imagine that the food that we're consuming um, is ahistorical or doesn't have a justice frame because mm -hmm. the bodies that produce it, their lives matter. Right. And right now, the whole food system is rooted in exploitation. And so food sovereignty is about the workers and the earth and the consumers. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So as communities sort of struggle with these big issues, you know, in the news we see police violence, we see school violence, we see um, increased criminalization of drugs and other mm -hmm. mass incarceration, things like that. How does um, food injustice, um, how does that play into that, that, that whole paradigm? Oh my goodness, in so many ways, right? So obviously it's the same monster of white supremacist capitalism and patriarchy that destroys our schools and our communities and drives mass inc incarceration that also um, drives food injustice. Mm -hmm. So we're really dealing with those same root causes. Um, I know in upstate New York, one of the challenges that we face even more directly is that with the get big, get out and the loss of parity pricing, the dairy farmers are going out of business, you know, the small farmers go out of business. Mm -hmm. And the response of the state to replace that economic model is to build prisons. Mm. And those prisons have become the primary economic drivers in many small communities. And so there's actually an incentive for mass incarceration coming from these rural white communities. And that wasn't accidental. You mm -hmm. know, starting with Bacon's Rebellion, the owning class got really worried mm -hmm. um, about poor white people and poor black people taking up arms together. And so they've created policies that entrench these divisions. Uh, there's a number of children, we do youth programming at the farm and we work with youth who are targeted by state violence. Mm -hmm. um, for three years, we ran uh, something called Project Growth, which was an alternative to incarceration. Wow. And the young people would tell us how, you know, they'd get picked up for loitering or they'd get picked up for vagrancy. And mm -hmm. both of these quote unquote crimes came out of the black codes. This is like old agricultural yeah. stuff, right? And, uh, and then they would be given a public defender because they couldn't afford a lawyer and they'd tell them to cop a plea, mm -hmm. which means to plead guilty. Even if you're innocent, then you got a record, then you're in this downward spiral, right? And so... Uh, we worked with this, these youth, and if they graduated from our 50-hour training program, then they had their records wiped. And so it was wow. a, a small act in this big system, but sort of a point of intervention in the school-to-prison pipeline that was uh, something tangible that we could offer as a, as a community institution, you know, as a farm, to try to directly address the way that this was harming our youth. Mm -hmm. So recently, there's been a lot of public support and excitement around the movie Black Panther. Well, kind of forever. <laughs> um, and uh, just that vision, I saw the film and I was deeply moved and excited by it myself. And the vision of an autonomous, powerful, um, technologically advanced, mm -hmm. agrarian society um, in Africa was really um, inspirational to me. And um, I'm wondering what your opinion is um, about, <laughs> is that a fantasy? Could there ever be um, an agrarian, African-American, and Latino um, um, community that's technologically advanced and, <laughs> and cohesive and, and powerful? Well, I certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. So I will tell you about this movie, and I'm not a movie critic, but uh, mm -hmm. we went to go see it, 10 of us from Soul Fire Farm, all farmers. And so, mm -hmm. cool. spoiler alert, you know, at the very end, when they're at the United Nations meeting mm -hmm. and this one uh, diplomat says, you know, with all due respect, what mm -hmm. can a nation of farmers do for the rest of the world? We all just stood up and <laughs> cheered. We're like, that's right. 
<laughs> what can a nation of farmers do? So much, so much, right? And so I certainly hold that vision. To me, it's you know, in similar to the wild seed vision, the acorn vision that Octavia Butler talks mm-hmm. about. And um, I think it's important for us to be able to hold on to something that looks, feels, smells like freedom. Mm. And we may not create exactly that, mm-hmm. um, but if we don't have that vision, we're pre-settling. We're actually creating a container for ourselves that's, sm- that's smaller than it needs to be mm-hmm. um, and giving ourselves the no before we actually actually encounter the external no. So let's do it. Let's do it and let's see where it takes us. Go for it. Okay, thank you. How does the practice of growing plants that are indigenous to West Africa, how is that part of, of, of some of the things that you've been talking about? Is that a part of it or is that just something that people, yeah. some people are doing. So this is something I'm, I'm really just leaning into more recently. Um, as you know, so much of African and indigenous contributions to sustainable agriculture have been erased mm-hmm. or miscredited. You know, that sort of happens with permaculture where we just take all these indigenous practices and box them up and then market them, you know, to profit white people. So disaggregating that and really understanding where our foods and practices come from has been my central work over the past couple of years. And I have a book coming out in November called Farming While Black that is all about that. Um, but just a few, you know, tangible examples of that, you know, we grow... Um, the Moya Mensing tomato, uh, which has a history of coming out of some of the prison, a prison in the South grown by African-American gardeners. Mm. Uh, the fish pepper, which has a long history in the Creole region of the United States to favor like gumbos and fish dishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, okra is an African crop, black eyed peas and sorghum. And sweet potatoes, while they're not African, have become the yam of the new world and taken that place and sacred ceremony that the yam had. And so all of these, uh, there's just such rich, rich, rich history. And so we are starting to claim that, name that, and teach that, um, and grow more indigenous crops um, to the African continent over time. And also crops that are not indigenous to Africa, but have become culturally significant in the diaspora. How can an average citizen support um, the um, Afro-ecological movement? Is that what it's called? Sure, I don't know what the movement's called. I always leave that to the theorists. I'm like, we just roll up our sleeves and do shit, you know? So they can decide what they want to call it. Um, There is an Afroecology, you know, sort of hashtag that you movement, I guess. Um, The average citizen, I mean, there's so much. I always think that, like, it's about the intersection of what the world needs Mm. and and what makes you come alive. Um, Certainly, the easy thing to say is that We're all about reparations, and so we started creating uh, what we're calling the Reparations Map Project, Mm -hmm. where we have people who have graduated from our programs and other black and brown farmers who are just putting out there what it is that they need as far as land, training, support uh, for their farm projects. And so you can find it on our website, and you can directly contact the farmer, and just if you have the resource they need, give that resource over um, as a way of correcting and beginning to address some of the historical um, injustice that we've inherited. So that's one way. And then, you know, we have political power too. And so we've been, as a, a national group, we've created the Heal Food Alliance, which has a policy platform of laws that we're trying to get passed or changed to address some of the structural issues that make it really hard for black farmers to access loans, for example, mm-hmm. or make it really hard for school children to get healthy food when they're being bombarded with junk food advertisements. So you can also check out like the Heal Food Alliance Real Food Platform mm-hmm. and uh, you know, thank you. Agitate. All right. <laughs> so you mentioned um, reparations, and I, I mm-hmm. just read that the UN's working group of experts on people of African descent recently reported to the UN's High Commissioner on Human mm-hmm. Rights that after a history of slavery, the U.S. owes reparations. Um, what are undeniably, your thoughts on that? Okay. Undeniably. And I don't even think it's about blame and shame. It's just true. You know, even if you just counted the wages of the enslaved African people in today's dollars, we're talking about over six trillion. Mm. Um, The Pew Research Center just came up with a figure that 80% of wealth is inherited. Most of it is traceable back to that time period. So we're not over it. We're not over it. The wealth that allows people to have relative security in their lives exists because of slavery. And the scarcity that we have in the black community exists because of slavery. Mm -hmm. And there's no way, you know, wages aren't it. Mm -hmm. It's really about wealth. 
Um, right now, if you are born black in America, your net worth is going to be one thirteenth of a white person mm -hmm. born in America. And that's gotten wider yeah. over my lifetime. When I was born, it was eight to one. Wow. So we got to do something about it, you know, and it's not about, you know, feeling bad or anyone's ancestors aren't good people. It's just we just live in an inequitable society and reparations is what's going to bring that equality. That's great. How does that influence reparations, the idea of, of, of this country giving back to, to the descendants of American slaves, how does that influence the idea of self-support through community-based agriculture? Mm -hmm. Are they, they're not opposed? Are oh they, no, okay. definitely not. I mean, our okay. community has always engaged in, in self-help and self-support. We created cooperatives, we created credit unions. You know, when, when we were forced to be sharecroppers and tenant farmers, we worked on Sundays and saved our own money to buy 16 million acres of land um, by 1910 in an environment that was so hateful, just full of, you know, thousands of lynchings in that time period. Mm -hmm. So our community has always been about that, you know, but when you, when the pie is this big and your whole community has one little slice, you can share amongst yourselves all you want of that slice, but fund fundamentally you're not going to get to a truly just society until you divide up that pie fairly. Right. Are food insecurity and housing insecurity linked in any way, in your opinion? Well, I think it's the same beast that definitely leads to both of them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're aware of the redlining crisis that yep. began in the 1930s mm -hmm. and really didn't, I mean, it really hasn't ended. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I just went um, online to search some home values mm -hmm. and they were on Zillow and they were still using color coding for neighborhoods and red for the poor neighborhoods in Albany, New York, where we deliver oh food. This was weeks ago, what? right? So it's not technically redlining, but... but it's the same the, color and, in the same, and same color and the same end the same result. Thing. So wow. for those who don't know, essentially when the federal government actually commissioned this redlining project, which was to outline black and brown neighborhoods in red and then discourage lending. Um, and then when folks were getting back from uh, the World War and the GI Bill was in effect, white people then could get loans to buy homes in their communities and that lifted up the aggregate wealth of the white community. Black people could not because of redlining. Mm -hmm. And so what you have then is you have this like concentration of poverty and disinvestment and really lack of access to land that very much mirrored what was going on in the South with mm -hmm. farmers being dispossessed of their land because of USDA discrimination, mm -hmm. taking away our land, taking away our resources, taking away our wealth. Mm -hmm. And that is what leads to poverty and food insecurity. Right. How have people responded to your work? What's the response been? Uh, well, I think overwhelmingly, it's become clear that the work is necessary because people have responded um, with, with open hearts and enthusiasm, you know? I mean, for example, we first started the Black Latinx Farmers Immersion um, with a Facebook post because I was curious if anyone would be interested in coming and learning how to farm like way out in the middle of the woods in mm -hmm. upstate New York. And that program filled up in 24 hours. So I made another week for, and that filled up in 24 hours. And everything that we do has these extensive waiting lists and so to me, you know, more than verbal affirmation or anything is just knowing that our community needs us to be doing this like hands on survival work and training work. Um, and as long as that's the case, we're going to be in it. That's great. <clears throat> Who is supporting you right now in your endeavors? Our team. OK. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Any future plans? Well, one thing that's really exciting is we recently convened the Northeast Farmers of Color Network, and we've had a couple of winter meetings to chat about our experiences, build relationships. And what's emerging is the need for a regional land trust that can help preserve, defend, and acquire more black and brown lands. So we have some lawyers that are helping us out um, and a lot of energy and momentum behind it, and we're excited about building this collective vehicle to try to reclaim and decolonize land in our community. It's fantastic you answered the question that I had that I didn't have time for. Uh, <laughs> um, what makes a farm or garden a healthy one? Mm. If the soil gets deeper every year and has more organic matter, and the pollinators come back, and the human beings are full of song and laughter, and the resources are shared with the community. Yeah. Organic? We're not certified organic. Okay. The USDA has undermined what organic means. As you saw, they just 
eliminated all the humane treatment for animals requirements in the organic label. So we are certified naturally grown and we're also food justice certified through the Agricultural mm -hmm. Justice Project, which are more rigorous peer-to-peer -peer, uh, supervision programs. Uh, last question. Every mm -hmm. episode of this show will have a little practical or a big challenge for each of our guests um, mm. uh, to share with some of our viewers. Um, what is your sustainability tip? So my sustainability tip is that you actually do not need to till the soil ever because microbes and earthworms will do it for you. If you cover your soil with a plastic mulch, a straw mulch, or a cardboard, and leave that for six weeks in the hot season or you know 12 weeks in the cold season, those magical creatures are gonna totally do all the aeration and weed eating that you need. And so you can capture carbon from the atmosphere rather than releasing it on your farm and be carbon negative. So that's my tip. And you can find us at www.soulfirefarm.org. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us Thank today. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. This is the Sustainability Sentinel, and we've been speaking with Leah Penniman, co-director of Soulfire Farm outside Albany, New York.